from the sun, the gradient of that gravitational potential with respect to distance. So the same thing that causes the force to change the direction changes the clocks to change the bias direction so that it still looks like my clocks, still looks like the speed of light is C on the Earth. A neat effect, but they claim it's not even there. And they claim it's not there because of ILTs. Now it turns out, uh, just a little bit more, the spin speed of the, of the, uh, of the either the Earth's surface or the GPS satellite also creates a bias. Uh, and because it adds in one case, the clock goes slower. In one case, the clocks go faster. And that also makes sure that as the Earth is spinning, that clock bias is still in the right direction. Beautiful, beautiful design, in my opinion, to create, make it so it looks like the speed of light is always C on the Earth and makes it much easier to run experiments. And I call that an amazing result. Clocks appear to be Einstein synchronized on the Earth, but actually what's really happening is you've got a celery transformation with a clock bias. If you undid that clock bias on the Earth, it would look like the speed of light was, was isotropic with respect to the sun. Okay? Okay. A um, couple papers that say here's how to go between the sun's frame and the Earth's frame. Uh, use a Lorentz transformation. Actually, they don't use a Lorentz transformation. It won't work. But they do map the clocks across without a bias term. But that's got a problem. Let's look at that problem. Um, that claim to, to do it the way they do it would actually cause the physical clocks would have to run at two different rates. One rate for the Earth and one rate for the Sun. So if the gravitational potential doesn't do what I just said it does, if the ILTs really canceled out that gravitational effect, then we'd have to have clocks running at two different rates and two different frames. I say that that's rather illogical. You could, in fact, perhaps do something like that if it weren't cyclical, but a cyclic difference just cannot occur in two clocks running at the same rate. Okay? Um, another interesting thing that turns out, uh, you know, I, I assume I, pretty much all of us, I think, agree that a clock runs slower when it's moving faster. But a lot of people seem to question the length contraction effect. Well, if mass increases with velocity, which I think most people agree with, the inertial mass increases with velocity, then it turns out, just like that clock effect, when the speed adds, my inertial mass has increased, and if the conservation of momentum is to apply, that means I go a little bit slower on the top, that means I go a little bit faster on the bottom, but the Earth keeps moving at the same rate, so I get some length contraction in the orbit. Now it amounts to 10 centimeters, roughly, at GPS orbital height. So it's not very big. In fact, it could be lost in the noise of the measurements in most cases. But nevertheless, it's theoretically there. And, it's, and it, it had, if you believe in mass increase with velocity, you've got to believe in length contraction. Now it turns out, because that helps map the speed of light to C in the two frames, it's completely invisible to the normal way we measure it. But I believe VLBI, they're talking about putting uh, VLBI on the moon, and that's a large enough distance that you'll get something like a meter and a half of length orbit contraction. And I think if you use that to measure the direction of stars, you'll start to see a length contraction measurement for the very first time. It turns out it's an extremely hard thing to measure because it's, it's compensated for with other facts. Okay. Just a little bit more about this Earth effect. I claim that if we, for example, if we use the sun as the reference frame up there, because of Earth's movement and clock slowing and, and length contraction, we get a moving frame. Now, if you add a clock bias, you'll get what looks like a Lorentz transformation. In other words, the speed of light does look like it's C. Now, it turns out, if you go through the math care carefully, it's scale different. The speed of light is gamma squared slower in the Earth's frame than it would have been in the uh, Sun's frame. And there are some other effects that one needs to watch out for. But uh, the, that scaling effect is ignored, and that's why when you do the reverse process, you have to go back that reverse way. 
in order to show that momentum and energy are conserved, you have to remove the clock bias. Then you can see that they're conserved, and then you can transform back to the sun. So it goes in the opposite fashion, and a Lorentz transformation, per se, will not really work. It's scaled wrong among, uh, for one thing. Okay. I have suggested the experiment in one of the papers in which I use the Mossbauer effect, namely the same thing that measures that free fall, to, to say that ILTs not, uh, do, do not work. They claim that the Earth falling cancels the effect. Well, if I had a falling Mossbauer experiment, just like they did at Harvard, where they measured the change in frequency, I claim in fall they would still measure it, whereas what they're claiming is that that acceleration of the fall cancels it out. I don't know how expensive this would be to do, but it's, it's an experiment I'm plugging and I'm hoping that someday we'll get to do. Okay, next. Finally, we're ready for the next section. Uh, this cartoon incidentally says, aha, just as I expected, aha, just as I expected, aha, just as I expected, boom. <laughs> so so uh, some things we don't expect. <laughs> we're talking about the conservation of energy, gravitational potential effect, and some velocity effect in turn, the, an unusual velocity effect uh, in my estimation. Okay? <clears throat> I say there's some huge implications of that first thing we derived, namely that the energy, radiant energy, does not increase when it's falling. And one of the things that that, that says is that gravity does act on electromagnetic radiation, and that's a huge uh, problem. In fact, uh, I think it's Davies in his, one of his books claims that this is the biggest problem in physics that. Uh, that the energy of the vacuum is on the order of 10 to the 120th, and yet they can't see any effect of it uh, due to you know mass change or curvature, etc. Et uh, and this kind of solves that problem because it says electromagnetic energy is not acted on by gravity directly. Uh, and I say if the energy level of electrons changes with potential, then I think the rest mass energy must change with gravitational potential as well. And that implies that gravity doesn't supply any energy at all. It simply converts the rest mass energy into kinetic energy when it falls. Among other things, that says kinetic energy can't be acted on by gravity because it would be trying to convert kinetic energy to kinetic energy. <coughs> so let's go on. <coughs> Uh, a little bit about that, uh, not nearly the detail I'd like to go into, but if gravitational energy comes from the rest mass energy, then the spatial gradient of that gravitational energy should give me the gravitational force. Well, up in the top row equation, you see the scale factor for gravity that Einstein used in his developments. You see another one that's often used that's called the isotropic scale factor, and they're different. The, the second one is the one that I would use, I think, you know, almost immaterial to this, I believe in a solid ether that's compressed, if you will, and the way, the, the way pressure would relax would be exponentially. So that's another argument for this one. Well, they're different in their third order terms, second order power of, uh, of GM, and if you take that gradient, uh, where I say the total energy is mc squared times s, uh, incidentally, the, then, then when you take that derivative, you get the bottom equation, the force, and that S reminds, it stays in the top. In other words, some of the energy is, is canceled out when you fall. There's less energy in the total system, and that's the defect energy. In other words, just like an electron in an orbit around an atom, has, there's been some energy gained by going to that orbit. Same way this would argue that when a when a, you drop an orbit, there's less energy uh, total available. Well, it turns out if you take Einstein's scale factor and take that same derivative, the S winds up in the denominator, saying that the force gets stronger instead of weaker. Uh, but if the force gets weaker, like we claim, then you automatically have no black holes because it gets weaker and weaker as the gravity gets stronger and stronger. I don't think I put it in here, but it also explains the anomalous redshift that you see from some of the dark, the blue stars that have never been explained. And Arp, in one of his books, Seeing Red, talks about that mismatch uh, some. So let's go on. 
Uh, implications continued. Uh, back up one, I think. 